cultural understanding that involves the convergence of diverse cultural, national, and personal perspectives. ZJLF has evolved to become an internationally recognized platform where readers and authors connect, where ideas and thoughts meet, and where the young and old debate on topics that impact communities and the world at large. I'm sure we need a lot of this debate with the recent unfolding events that are happening all over the world. With this contagious creative energy and vibrant mix of art, culture, and people, the festival has contributed immensely in attracting tourists from India and abroad, introducing them to the right blend of the modern present and the glorious past of the city of Jaipur. Cox and Kings is India's leading travel group, believes that the diverse literary art and cultural traditions of each destination is what unique travel experiences are made of. With this in mind, we are here to celebrate the passion for both travel and writing. And what better way to sample this celebration than to uncover unique insights into travel writing by some of the greatest travel writers of our time. Please join me in welcoming award-winning writer and director of the Jaipur Literature Festival, the Mr. William Dalrymple, who will now take over as a moderator of a special travel session. Footloose, the travel session. Aarti Prasad, B. Rowlett, Brigitte Keenan, Nidhi Dagar, and Simon Winchester, along with Rod Schmitz, are in conversation with William Dalrymple. Aarti Prasad worked in cancer genetics at the Imperial College of Science, Technology and Medicine in London. In 2009, she presented Channel 4's controversial documentary, Is It Better in the, to Be Mixed Race, and wrote and presented the two-part BBC4 documentary, The Quest for Virgin Birth. B. Rowlett is a writer and journalist. Her current book, In Search of Mary, is inspired by the life of Mary Wollstonecroft and the best-selling talking about Jane Austen in Baghdad, which has been published by Penguin, has been dramatized by the BBC and translated into numerous languages. B won the Society of Authors Cape Blundell Trust Award to complete the travels for In Search of Mary. Nidhi Dagar is the author of the recently published book the Lost, Lost a Generation Chronicling India's Dying Professions. A young journalist from Kolkata, she has written extensively on book society subcultures and cultural oddities in newspapers and magazines. Currently, she's working on a second book which will be published by Penguin Random House, again to be out in 2018. We are also proud to have Simon Winchester, a British author and journalist who resides in Massachusetts, in the United States. Through his career at The Guardian, Winchester covered numerous significant events, including Bloody Sunday and the Watergate scandal. As an author, Winchester has written or contributed to more than a dozen nonfiction books, has, a, has a written one novel, and his articles have appeared in several travel publications, including Condé Nast Traveler, Smithsonian Magazine, and National Geographic. I'm sure that uh, he, as, as proud as he is to be here, he would also have liked to have been in Washington over the last weekend to see the momentous events unfurling over there, something that, you know, in the free world is really quite uh, amazing. William Dalrymple is a Scottish historian and writer, art historian and curator, as well as a prominent broadcaster and critic. His books have won numerous awards and prizes. But before I go there, we are also proud to have Rob Schmitzen, who is the Shanghai correspondent of the National Public Radio. He's author of Street of Eternal Happiness, Big City Dreams, along the Shanghai Road. And to end our, our, our uh, then, you know, then Sir William's uh, impressive list of, uh, of, of, of prizes, he got the Duff Cooper Memorial Prize, the Thomas Cook Travel Book Award, the Sunday Times Young British Writer of the Year Award, the Hemingway, the Kapuchinsky, and the Wilson Prizes. He has been four times long-listed and once shortlisted for the Samuel Jackson Prize for nonfiction. He's also one of the co-founders and co-directors of the annual 
Jaipur Literature Festival. I'm sure you've heard enough of my voice. Let's get down to them on the Footloose trial session. Thank you. Thank you, Captain. Just a quick word about uh, Cox and Kings. Um, we are, the most difficult thing about this festival is to keep it going and keep it free. Uh, we've had five days of the greatest minds of the world uh, and we make no charge for anyone. This is only possible because of our amazing sponsors. With demonetization, um, some of our best friends, such as Ford and Google, dropped out. Uh, and we will not be making a profit this year. And thanks to Cox and Kings, we're not going to go bust. So thank you very much. If, you, if there's any wonderful bankers or hedge fund managers sitting in the crowd today, we need sponsorship and help. If you have any brothers or cousins or uncles who are rich Mawari businessmen, uh, we would love to hear from them all. Uh, it is the most difficult thing about running this festival. We now, almost everyone says yes to attending it, uh, and we have between a third and half a million people coming to see us, but uh, sadly the sponsors are not coming with quite the same alacrity. So if you can help, please have a word with me or Sanjoy uh, later. Um, we sadly have lost Bridget Keenan, um, who rather alarmingly had a stroke on stage at the Gold Literary Festival last week. Uh, but she's recovering well, and Rob Schmitz has kindly uh, come to take her place. Um, travel literature, just to say a word about it, is, along with poetry, the most ancient and universal, universal form of literature uh, in the world. Uh, it, by many millennia, predates the novel. Uh, or, uh, uh, or, or, or drama and, and plays. Uh, it appears uh, in cuneiform tablets uh, in the citadels of Uruk and Nineveh in Mesopotamia uh, with the wanderings of, the, of Gilgamesh, uh, the wanderings of the patriarchs of the Old Testament. Um, the early chapters of the Bible are really travel books. Uh, as are uh, obviously the wanderings of the Pandava brothers in the Mahabharat. Um, it appears in China, in Japan, the wanderings of Basho and the, uh, the Buddhist monks, Farhesian and Huan Sang. It appears in Europe with Marco Polo, uh, the many great uh, Arab sailors, Ibn Jubaya, uh, Ibn Battuta, uh, who explored their parts of the world. Uh, so it's something very basic and very universal. Um, I think it was raised in the 1930s to a very high literary point by writers such as Robert Byron, who's a particular favorite of mine, even more. Um, and then had a remarkable revival again in the 80s and 90s with the generation of people like Bruce Chatwin, Reuben O'Hanlon, uh, Ryzard Kapuscinski, um, and Jan Morris, who's worked a lot with Simon Winchester. Uh, and two particular favorites of mine, uh, Bruce Chatwin and Patrick Lee Fermor, Paul Theroux, who we've had before. Uh, and I think um, all these writers have shown that despite globalization, despite the fact that everyone now travels, the travel writer still has an extraordinary job to do, to see beneath the surface of increasing homogeneity uh, and to see the oddness of life that, that lies beneath. Uh, particularly, I think, travel writers today uh, focus in on people and individuals uh, and explore the strangeness of the human race with many of the techniques of the novel, dialogue and description, uh, but without uh, making anything up. I'm just going to start by um, reading from um, a friend of mine's work uh, who died 10 years ago, the remarkable Italian travel writer Tiziano, Tiziano Terzani, uh, at the request of his daughter uh, Saskia. Um, his latest book, uh, which is called One More Ride on the Merry-Go-Round, which is an extraordinary description of his, uh, his journey through cancer. His last journey was one of suffering uh, and illness. Um, and he took the very, um, he was an extraordinary man, Tiziano. He covered all the wars of the 1960s, uh, was there in Vietnam, brought his children up in Mao, China, while reporting from there, where his children famously went to hand grenade practice uh, with the Maoist uh, guards and so on, um, uh, Saskia among them. And he moved to Delhi towards the end of his life, and he believed that India was the one place which remained absolutely fascinating in Asia, where he'd spent his life. He loved this country. And when he got cancer, uh, and it looked as if it was probably going to be incurable, he took the very brave decision not to go to chemotherapy, 
uh, but to, um, to, ha to take uh, palliative Ayurvedic care. And he moved up to the foothills of the Himalayas uh, uh, to die there. And I'm just going to read a few passages at his daughter's request uh, of, of this beautiful last book, which has just been translated into English. We have to realize, he writes, that life and death are merely two aspects of the same thing. Achieving this is perhaps the real goal of the journey we all embark upon the day we are born, a journey which I too profess not to know too much about, apart from its direction. I now know that it goes from the outside to the inside, from the large to the small, sorry, from the small to the large, and then the larger. As the days went by, I got the impression that the silence outside my mountain refuge was being matched by the silence within me. Sitting on a rock high up on a ridge, at times for hours on end, with none of the anguish induced by the sense of time passing, all wrapped up against the cold, looking out over the horizon, crossed by chain after chain of blue and white mountains, I had moments of sheer ecstasy. The same wind caressing me was the one swaying the blades of grass at my feet and driving the clouds in the sky. The life that I sensed all around me in the plants, the flowers, and the animals was the same life that courses through my veins. I was alone, but wherever I looked, there were dozens, hundreds, an infinite number of other existences. Everywhere there was life, in various forms and at various stages coming into being. The cosmic spider at the moment was spinning the web of the universe, each part of which was held together by the same thread, like the pearls on Indra's necklace, each capable of reflecting the other. And this spider had no need of a seventh day to rest. It just carried on spinning. What wonderful visions of creation these are. A creation which is taking place right here and now, taking place continuously not one that is lost in time, which took place over six days only. Tiziana Tazani, gentlemen. We have that rarest of beasts today, gender balance on our, uh, on our panel, um, unlike the misogyny <laughs> debate earlier. Um, Nidhi, would you like to start? We'll, we'll go around from there. So I'm reading this uh, re reading from the chapter uh, of my book called The Godna Artists of Jharkhand. Uh, basically, the Godna Artists of Jharkhand are the tattoo artists um, who are nomads and who move around from village to village inscribing tattoos. So this was one of the Godna ceremonies that I witnessed. And uh, there I go. A tribal hamlet appears a few kilometers into the jungle. About 30 thatched huts scattered about like drunken men after a merry revelry. A gathering of women have formed a circle in a cleared patch of land, some with chubby babies hanging at their waist. Two musicians from the village, a drummer and a man plunking at a string instrument, sit in a corner outside the circle. There is a volley of hooting cries and then a rattle of drums, the soundtrack to which a mother from a nearby hut drags her squealing daughter by the arm. Thick tears of protest flow down the child's cheeks and onto her sleeveless frock as she is pulled to the middle of the circle. This is the child's godna ceremony, Salim whispers as he watched from a distance. Salim was the gentleman accompanying me. If a, child, if a girl child is old enough to walk, she must be tattooed. The tattoo is known as godna. Rarely is a ritual deferred until the early teens. And in any case, it must be accomplished before the girl is married. Tears drip down the face of the child, her shoulders shaking with quiet sobs as her mother whispers something in her ear, perhaps the promise of rice boiled in sweet milk to be prepared for her later in the evening. The mother rocks her rhythmically, soothing the harsh, painful thoughts in her daughter's head. Perhaps she's hoping the next child she's carrying in her visibly pregnant belly is a son who can escape this pain. The malhar or the tattoo artist who will engrave the godna pulls out the tools with his suit-covered hand. The crowd cheers as he picks up a three-pronged metal implement and meticulously begins to make a tilak on the child's head, a teardrop-shaped mark between her eyebrows. With each wrap of the malhar's old instrument, droplets of blood begin to form around the lesions. They converge to form a stream of blood that spills down the child's cheek. 
A few women break into song and dance, a ritual, going round and round in circles, the child momentarily distracted by them. They sing obscene songs about loose pajamas that fall off a man's smooth backside, and then another about a cat chasing a dog up to the river, diverting the child's attention with a debauchery. The child cackles with laughter, even as tears hang precariously on her jaws, like dewdrops from a leaf. A few more songs later, the singers plunge onto the dust with arms stretched out, signifying the celebration of girl's definite journey to heaven after death and her reunification with her ancestors. Just then, a needle slips and digs a bit too deep into the child's skin, pulling it upwards like an earthworm on a fishing hook, making the child scream in pain. The singers sit up, shaking their heads, disapproving of the child's weak will. An old lady, tall, lean, and bent at waist, with tattoo marks folding into a graceful network of wrinkles along her neck, jumps up and the drummer steps up the rhythm in anticipation. The road to law is full of obstacles. She addresses the audience in Kuruk, a Dravidian language. The door is heavily guarded by large black demons. The one old one narrates, clawing her fingers and sticking her tongue out to signify the demon. The child quietens down, drawing images of the dark, perilous dungeon of the Lord in her head. Those without the godna, the old lady roars, will be branded with hot coals in hell, thrown on cacti, and pushed through sugarcane extracting machines. This purgatory has been described to the child before, in old folk tales and legends of even men who steal sweets from the village kitchens. The child sits quietly through the rest of the ceremony, wincing every now and then, as if wondering which woman in the crowd looked most like the demon that was just described. The rest of the ceremony is carried out in the instructions of the old lady, Naudi Tikri, who turns out to be the child's grandmother. It's afternoon by the time Malhar finishes tattooing the child's forehead and even cheeks on the insistence of the grandmother to prevent evil spirits from casting their eyes on the child. The tattoos look more like angry swollen whelms than works of art. The musicians and dancers have long retired to the fields and the child is tired, dried blood congealed on her cheeks and eyes drooping with sleep. Careful now, use the turmeric sparingly. Nauri spits, baring her remaining teeth. My son works hard for this money. The mother is carefully bending over the child as she smears turmeric paste all over the child's body. The touch of the lower caste malhar on the child is believed to have caused contamination and requires a purging of dirt with warm water and haldi. Nauri reminisces that as a young girl, when malhars came to village for godna, they would use the route along the village that passed through the jungles. These untouchable men were not allowed to wear footwear once inside the village and were barred from wearing clothes above the waist and below the knees, even in cold winters of the forest. In those days of the Malhar or the women folk known as Malharin were given food for their services. The bowl which had touched would be cleaned with cow urine and then heated over water to be purified. That's about it. Thank you. Um, William kindly listed a panoply of the great, great writers of travel, but he missed one out. Mary Wollstonecraft, you might know the name for other reasons, but she was a hugely influential travel writer in the 1790s and also very recently on me. But she wrote what became a bestseller. She traveled around Scandinavia. It was called Letters from Norway. And it was a sensation amongst the romantics. Indeed, Samuel Taylor Coleridge nicked a bit of it for Kubla Khan. And it was, it was a really a game changer for, in, the, in much the way of Lawrence Stern, it was, a, it was a genre shifting piece of travel writing. And I didn't know this about her, and many people don't when they learn about Mary Wollstonecraft. What do we know about her? She was the foremother of feminism, she was a great human rights campaigner, a key Enlightenment philosopher. Amartya Sen calls her perhaps the most underrated thinker of the 18th century. Um, and that's what I knew until I got my hands on this tra travel book that she wrote and found to my intense delight that there was a juicy backstory to the story of her travels which on the face of it appear to be her wandering around countries being quite rude to everybody, which is very entertaining. Nonetheless, behind this is a very, very juicy and also depressing story. Wollstonecraft had gone to Paris in the teeth of the revolution. 
she arrives in the same week that William Wordsworth leaves because it's all getting a bit scary. Not a problem for Wollstonecraft. She comes, she lives in the revolution, she falls in love. The great foremother of feminism has this catastrophic relationship with a very dodgy geezer from America called Gilbert Imlay. They have a baby. I am getting to the reading, trust me, and the reading will be short because I don't want to hog the time, but the setting's very important as to why I did this. Um, they had this baby and the relationship came apart. And it turns out that her boyfriend, the ne'er-do-well, has been smuggling silver from the head-chopped aristocrats of Paris. And he's been sending it on shipments north to neutral Scandinavia because the crown heads of Europe are at war, of course, with, with revolutionary France. One of his shipments of silver goes missing. And guess who gets sent to retrieve the silver? You got it, Mary Wollstonecraft. That is what she was really doing. It's the story behind her travel book. And when I discovered that, that was just a sensation to me. I just, I became addicted. This is, I've been obsessed with this book for a very long time and I couldn't quite let that go. The idea that in 1795, Mary Wollstonecraft became the world's first and only treasure hunting, single mum, enlightenment philosopher on the high seas. <laughs> What's not to love? <laughs> so eventually, oh, I'm glad, love for Wollstonecraft. Eventually I retraced the journey that she made. And oh, also, almost forgot to mention, she traveled with the baby, with the aforementioned so-called illegitimate baby, accompanied her on this journey. So to make life easy, I retraced her journey, taking with me the, the, my smallest baby, 10 months old, who was the same age as her baby, when she traveled. So that's the setting for the book, and my wish for the book was to illuminate aspects of her life. Um, I only found out an hour ago that we were supposed to be doing a reading of about six or seven minutes, and I thought, oh my goodness, I should try and find a bit which really illustrates how I pulled together the politics, you know, Wollstonecraft at the beginning of the Enlightenment, and now, you know, where have we come, women's lives, how can I do that? I'm going to go the complete opposite way. I'm going to read a very short extract of no significance whatsoever where nothing happens. I've just... Um, uh, uh, in, in the course of our, our travels, I ended up in California and uh, went on some consciousness raising and was thereafter traveling back to stay in a house full of witches. You know, California. And this happened. The route back to San Francisco is stunning. There's a long stretch of motorway, or should that be freeway, that runs alongside the sea, I mean ocean. I can hardly keep my eyes on the road ahead. The light hits off the giant rollers, muscling their way into the shoreline. The sheer width spreads away with nothing but more and more coast on either side, and nothing else out to sea but more sea. It's a complete change from Norway, the intricate, baffling coastline. It's gigantic. Will, and Will's the baby, Will, we have to stop. We can't let this go by. I pull over and park on a nowhere bit of roadside, and the wind is fierce when I pull Will out of his warm car seat. We nearly get lifted from our seat as we make a run for it, over the road to the ocean side, down a few boulders, and straight onto the beach. We run on the sand together, pushed and harried along by the wind, empty coastline reaches away on both sides, and the wind blows our breath back in as we laugh in its face. I see my Will, he was 10 months old, I see my Will lean into the wind. He spreads his arms and looks back at me. His belly is poking over his trousers. His thin hair is blown back, revealing the dome of his head. He scampers on the sand, his boots scarcely make an impression. We laugh and turn and run around with our arms out. This small, shining moment is one I won't lose. It shoots deeply into my heart. I sweep him up and we scramble back into the safe stillness of the car. We're bright and wind scrubbed, breathless and laughing. Why are these moments so rare? Can they be manufactured? Did I really have to come all the way to California to see my son laugh on a beach in a way that cut through to last forever? No, it just came this way. Whether he dies tomorrow or lives way beyond me, I will keep this preserved like a bubble in glass. I will always be in love with what just happened. 
And the reason, just very briefly to, to, to link on from that, one of the great joys and selfish luxuries of travel writing, writing is to capture that moment, which we've all got them, everyone's got a precious moment. And why do they stick? What is it that makes them? And it was Vita Sackville West that said that writing is the, the clapping of the net over the butterfly of the moment. And that's what I hope to achieve there. So I'm going to read uh, from my book, Street of Eternal Happiness. Uh, this is a book that I wrote about a single street in Shanghai. I decided to take a few years and get to know the individuals who live and work along a single street to sort of chronicle some of the changes that were happening, primarily because China's economy uh, is moving so quickly that entire generations can sort of unfold within just six or seven years, and people's lives change so quickly. Um, I decided to focus on, so there's about five characters in this book. I'm, just, I'm focusing on the youngest character. I've noticed that at this festival, there are so many young people, and I love the spirit of this festival because of that. And so I want to talk a little bit, and I want to write a little bit about uh, a young person in my book who was born, he's known as a post-80s generation. And there's a, in, in China, you have many generations. There's a post-80s, there's also a post-90s generation uh, because things happen so quickly, and they are... The, the, the differences between the two are so vast in how they see the world. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, this character. His name is CK, and he comes from the countryside. He ends up in Shanghai working as an accordion engineer. He engineers accordions and teaches migrants how to put them together. He made tons of money doing this, and then he starts his own little sandwich shop uh, after going to Chicago and being inspired by a sandwich shop in Chicago. Uh, and he does terribly. The sandwich shop doesn't make any money. He's losing tons of money. But he doesn't really care because he's, it's attracting artists and musicians just like him. Young culture connoisseurs like CK label themselves Wen Yi Qing Yan, literally cultured youth, or Wen Qing for short. The term was often translated as hipster, but Wen Qing evoked a love of art, culture, and living life to its fullest without the snobbery and cynicism associated with the hipster label in the West. Another difference was that hipsters were often born into the cozy suburban middle class of a developed economy. Wen Qing were not, and they had to work hard to find their way through a competitive and intricate system to earn money to support their interests. CK's generation grew up in a China that was emerging from decades of economic hibernation. They were China's first generation in nearly 50 years who had opportunities to work for the time and the means to do things like study existentialism, watch independent films, and visit art galleries. Wenqing were those who incorporated these new ideas into the way they lived, altering their value systems and making life decisions based on these fresh, oftentimes global perspectives. In the course of reporting this, I realized that a lot of Wenqing, or cultured youth, were heading, were leaving the urban centers of, of, of Shanghai, Beijing, Guangzhou, and they were flocking to places uh, that were clean, that had clean water and clean air. One of these places in China is called Dali. It's a city in southwest China that attracted many urban refugees uh, who wanted to live a simpler life. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that now. Dali was everything cities like Beijing and Shanghai weren't. The pace of life was slow, wages low, and the air and water were clean. The locally grown food safe to eat. The lake town was completely surrounded by snow-capped mountains. It was an ideal place for idealists. More and more Wenqing from the cities were arriving in town to stay in search of a better life. On a reporting trip I took to Dali in 2013, I met several people CK's age who had dropped everything and moved there from the big city. We've met more friends here in a year and a half than we did in our 14 years in the city, one urban transplant boasted to me. She had moved there with her husband and three-year-old daughter from Guangzhou, where the two adults had worked long hours in the import-export business. The urban refugees lived in a traditional courtyard home at the foot of the mountains above town, offering a panorama of the water and mountains. Each morning, they biked downhill to the old town to drop off their daughter at preschool and to open their wine-tasting gallery among the cobblestone lanes of the old town. Just like CK, the couple had established their shop in hopes of attracting like-minded people. There are more interesting people here from all walks of life, she told me as I enjoyed the view. We're friends with film directors, journalists, writers. We get together and talk about how life should be lived and our ideals. That's the last topic urban dwellers in China want to talk about. Back in Guangzhou, people were only interested in talking about buying new apartments or buying new cars. All of urban China has been engulfed in a whirlpool of consumption. Everyone is helpless, she told me. I asked them about the downsides of living in Dali. Healthcare was bad, they said. The schools weren't the best, and they were far away from family. The same downsides to being a foreigner in Shanghai. 
But the biggest disadvantage seemed to be money. None of the Wenching I had met there was independently wealthy, and between conversations about the evils of materialism, several of them quietly admitted they weren't making enough. They had traveled more than a thousand miles to sell wine, psychological advice, books, or coffee to people who were just like they used to be, tourists and transplants from the city who had money to spend. Their customers were daily reminders of a time when they were part of the consumer class. CK once referred to himself as a Wenching, but in true Wenching fashion, he immediately qualified the label, explaining he was more of an engineer by nature. It was his engineer's mind that had helped him secure a job and pay the bills, but it was hard to overlook the Wenching parts of CK. He was a musician, he read Nietzsche, he dabbled in drugs, and before establishing his sandwich shop, he worked in a store that specialized in lamography, an obscure art movement dedicated to a Russian camera that devotees used to take colorful lo-fi images of everyday objects. But there was also a fenqing side to CK. The term was short for fenuqingye, literally angry youth. It described young patriotic Chinese who were suspicious of foreign intentions in China, but who also didn't completely trust China's own leadership. Fenqing were deeply proud of the country's long history and cultural traditions, and they channeled that passion into fighting for a stronger Chinese role in global affairs. Apart from the generational groupings, the term was yet another categorical box young Chinese neatly sorted themselves into, making introductions a fatiguing exercise in pigeonholing. Are you a post-80s or a post-90s generation? Cultured youth or angry youth? Wenqing or Fenqing? After a while, the classifications seemed meaningless. To me, they were simply Qing, young. They were trying to make sense of their world, and they were doing what came naturally to young people everywhere. They were searching for happiness. Um, B has an advantage over me, because I only found out I had to read about two minutes ago. <laughs> um, but B, I also, the first book that I never wrote, that I was going to write, was about a, um, a Dutch flower painter called Maria Sibylia Marianne, who in the 17th century also um, had a, two daughters, an abusive husband, um, packed it all in, got on a ship to Suriname, with the specific aim of collecting flora. So, well, before Darwin, right? So these are pioneering women. We don't really hear those stories about, and that her travels were really important to her. So that really inspired me. Um, I've just written a book on, on medicine and health in India. Um, and when I was asked to write it, I didn't have a, a good conception of what that was or what that meant, being that there's a pluralistic system here, that people from different socioeconomic groups, from urban and rural centers, approach health and disease in different ways, from faith healing to the high tech. Um, and so I kind of also, my daughter, she's 15 now, but she was younger then, and I basically just put her on the plane with me. Um, we ended up in, in Dharavi, in the slums, to um, a tribal area in Gatchiroli with Naxalites, to, to um, a high-tech hospital in, um, in, in Mumbai, in Delhi. But what I thought I'd do is I'd read you a part of, from my introduction, which is about why I wrote the book and why I chose to write it in that way. Um, because I had, a, I had a bit of a dilemma. I mean, I am um, Indian origin, but I'm not Indian. And a lot of what I was discovering, and I was sure I was going to discover, was, was not good in the state of health in India. I didn't want to criticize from a place of no knowledge. I wanted the voices of people who knew and who'd been battling on the front lines of health. I wanted their voices to, to really come through. Though I spent a good part of my childhood in India, hold an OCI card, and was born to an Indian mother raised in Delhi and a Trinidadian father whose own father was taken into British indentured service from Uttar Pradesh, the stories in this book are still based on the observations of an outsider. Although I think I have come to the conclusion that everyone is an outsider to some part of their own country and even within their own cities. After completing my interviews for this book's final chapter, Heavy Hearted to be Leaving, I thought of something surgeon Dr. Umang Mathur told me as I left the Dr. Shroff Charity Eye Hospital in Delhi. India is everything they say it is, he said, and nothing. Still, with an outsider's eyes, even in a familiar landscape, sometimes you find the most wonderful stories in unexpected places. And so, ultimately, this is a book about how people in India approach health. 
It places center stage stories of Indians in the business of healing, from the forefront of cutting edge medical science to traditional street corner pharmacies dealing with all manner of diseases by all manner of means, all hoping to deliver a cure. In researching it, I have spent time with healers and with patients, finding out who they turn to and why. The projects I have covered and doctors I interviewed were chosen for a variety of reasons. Some were pioneers in their fields, others attracted celebrity clientele. Several have been powerful catalysts for change or have long family histories of medical practice. Yet others are passionate folk practitioners who fuse ancient tradition with modern technology or command vast numbers of patients who place their trust in them despite knowing little about the treatment they receive. My aim was to allow characters and their stories to speak for themselves, vibrant snapshots of health and disease, both inside a rapidly changing nation and in the work of its diaspora, who have long comprised a disproportionately large percentage of doctors and scientists across the world. Detailing the entire breadth and diversity of the practice of medicine in India is clearly beyond the scope of any one book. For every individual research center or hospital whose story I relate, there are hundreds of others whose narrative remains to be told. India has a long history of iconic, brilliant, scientific and medical minds. Its interaction with the wider world in the provision of knowledge, doctors or scientific or scholarly exchange go back millennia. The archaeology of the subcontinent is increasingly uncovering Indian innovation, reaching far into its prehistory. And so there are an almost uncapturable number of tales to tell. I would encourage everyone to continue to explore, engage, and collect the wisdom and wealth of human story this great country affords. Within the chapters that follow, my aim was to capture and curate a selection of stories that I found to reflect the experience of people from different socio-economic groups, from the educated to the illiterate, cities to forests, superstition to hard science. In India's rapidly changing landscape, any snapshot of now is soon destined to become a mere record of practices, some of which, in a few years' time, may well be obsolete. The stories told here move between rural and urban settings, from healing traditions rooted in India's religious, royal and colonial past to its 21st century innovations. From neuroscience to jungle berries, ancient formulae to e-health, royal wrestlers to pioneering heart surgery, these are tales about medicine in India, as complex, vibrant, inspiring and bewildering as the country itself. Um, yes, when, Willie, you were recounting Tiziano's uh, end-of-life memoir with that wonderful title, One More Ride on the Merry-Go-Round, I was thinking about if any of us do ever write our autobiographies, what title, what would be the summary of our lives? We all wander about endlessly, ceaselessly. And I came across, I was with my wife uh, two or three years ago, it was over Passover, in America, and one of the things that uh, Jewish people like to eat and can eat at Passover are coconut macaroons. So we went into a garage, and I said I was very hungry, and there was a cylinder of coconut macaroons. We brought them over to the car and took off the plastic lid, and there was a, um, a very tasty illustrations of big plump coconut macaroons on the on the cover, and we then peeled off the silver sort of vacuum. Uh, lid of this thing and looked down distressingly at a nearly empty can with a few miserable looking macaroons at the bottom and a sheet of sort of transparent grief, grease proof paper which my wife took out and looked at it and said to me the words that are printed on this piece of paper are perfect if you ever write an autobi autobiography for me and I guess for all of you. The words were some settling may occur. <laughs> What I'm going to read now <coughs> um, comes from the beginning of a book I did on Krakatoa, the big um, volcano which exploded so devastatingly and world-changingly at the end of August in 1883. And, and rather like you, it, it explains the rationale behind 
uh, writing it, why I decided, because I saw something rather remarkable. It was early on a warm summer's evening in the 1970s as I stood in a palm plantation high on a green hillside in western Java that I saw for the first time silhouetted against the faint blue hills of faraway Sumatra, the small gathering of islands that is all that remains of what was once a mountain called Krakatoa. There was a high peak on the left of the group, its pyramid shape cut off sharply by its vertical northern cliff. A couple of low islands hugged the horizon to the right. In between them was one small and perfectly formed, absolutely symmetrical low cone from which rose a thin wisp of smoke. The smoke left a blackish greyish trail that at first rose vertically and then as it caught the trade winds a few hundred feet above the darkening surface of the sea was whisked off to the left melting away until it became no more than a slow fading stain against the salmon glow of the sunset. I must have stood there enraptured until it got quite dark and then I turned away for the drive back to Jakarta. This I remembered thinking during the endless night of the flight back west had been a scene of impeccable beauty and all the more so because it presented a distant prospect of a place where the processes of the world were at work, a place of an elemental significance and disastrous place once but these days quiet again, serenely biding its time. It was almost another quarter of a century before I found myself back in Java. Most of the work I was doing then kept me in the island center in towns like Jogjakarta, Solo and Semarang. But just before I was due to fly away and because I had a free evening until my plane left, I decided on a whim to make my way back across to the western edge of the island. I drove down to the coast road just as I had back in the 70s. I wanted to go back for no other reason than to take what I thought would be one final look at a place that though few beyond the East Indies knew exactly where it was or what it looked like or just what had happened there, had a name, Krakatoa, that had for decades been firmly annealed into the world's collective consciousness. There was a famous film which admittedly placed the island on the wrong side, the east side of Java. There was a much-loved children's book which admittedly placed the island in, in a different ocean, the Pacific rather than the Indian. The name had become part of the world's cultural lexicon. It had a vaguely exotic familiarity about it, a certain indefinable resonance. It was a word that people seemed to like, both to say and to have said to them. And now here I was, so close to the volcano that the chance of seeing it once more seemed an opportunity I shouldn't pass up. When I reached the best viewpoint on the Corniche, it was evening, perhaps a little later, and so rather darker than when I'd been there last. This time, the enormous iron lighthouse near the port of Andia, built by the Dutch to replace the one that had been torn away by the terrible waves caused by the great eruption, was sweeping its beam calmly across the unruffled waters of the Sunda Strait, beginning its night on sentry duty. The group of islands was there just as before, now black against the vivid, deep pinks of the western sky. The giant peak to the left of the group was just as I remembered, the low islands too, this time merging with the evening clouds. And in the middle of them all, its summit seemingly rimmed with a curious orange fire, rose the pyramid shape of the one active remnant of the great disaster. And as I looked through my glasses, I could clearly see that the orange was indeed fire, and that from it rose smoke just as before, only this time a tumble of black billows that towered straight up into the windless late evening sky. But there was one obvious difference. The pyramid, which I now knew to be called Anak, locally Malay for the child of what had once existed there before the great eruption, seemed this time somehow bigger, sturdier, and much taller than I had remembered. I blinked hard, looked again. I measured it as best I could against the big peak to the left, trying to recall where the smaller mountain had stood in relation to that cliff wall. It was higher up now, surely. Yes, there was no doubt. Of course, memory does play tricks in situations like this. But as I stared long and hard, I became ever more certain the volcano, the child of Krakatoa, had grown very much larger during the 25 years that I'd been away. When I got back to the maps, I checked, and I could see in short order that the modern surveys all agreed. The small island mountain, which had been born out of the sea 40-odd years after the very explosion, that destroyed and vaporized its parent was now itself growing fast, thrusting upwards at an extraordinary rate. By looking at the old charts and maps that had been published down the years, 
since the last week of June 1927, when it was first seen above the waves, it was possible to calculate that it had been growing taller, fairly steadily, at an average rate of about five inches a week. True, there had been some fits and starts, a lava flow here, a wild eruption there, but generally, Anak Krakatoa had enlarged itself by 20 or so inches each month since 1927. Every year since its birth, it had become higher by 20 feet, and somewhere near 40 feet wider. And if this was indeed still so, I checked my figures once again, then it meant that my mountain was not simply taller, it was fully 500 feet taller than when I'd last seen it. Which is why this sturdy stripling of a volcano has captivated me ever since. It's a volcano that absolutely and very visibly refuses to die. It's a volcano that seems to me to possess a wonderfully seductive combination of qualities, being beautiful and dangerous, unpredictable and unforgettable. And more, though what happened in its former life was unutterably dreadful, the realities of geology, seismicity, and the peculiar tectonics of Java and Sumatra will make sure that what occurred back then will without a doubt one day repeat itself and in precisely the same way. No one can be sure exactly when, probably it'll be very many years, many years that is, before anything will befall all the world that could possibly be as terrible as what took place during the historic paroxysmal moment that reached its extraordinary climax at exactly two minutes past 10 on the morning of August the 27th, the Monday, 1883. To conclude, I'm going to read from um, my only non-Indian uh, travel book, um, which is a book of, about going around the Middle East in 1994 to visit the then dwindling Christian communities, many of whom are now not there at all. It's very odd uh, to find 20 years later that something you've written from observation has become effectively a history book, uh, a record of a lost world. One of the biggest changes was that when I was there, Syria was one of the most stable countries in the region. It had had the Assads in power for 20 or 30 years. Uh, and the neighboring country, Lebanon, was the country that had just gone through the paroxysms of a dreadful civil war. Uh, and driving out of Damascus in those days was to leave stability and peace and calm to go into um, this was literally the year that the Civil War had ended, so there was still kidnapping. It was, it was still a, a dangerous and unstable place. And I'd just like to read a description, which I've never actually read before, uh, of leaving Damascus um, and entering, uh, uh, traveling down to Beirut uh, in the autumn of 1994. I had just finished packing when the windows shook and with a noise like a revving chainsaw, the Beirut taxi drove up outside the front gate. It was a souped-up American Thunderbird the size of a small tank with chrome fenders and a sunshade jutting out above the windscreen. It was driven by a Lebanese spiv in Ray-Bans and a leather jacket. I embraced my anxious hosts. Then, with another roar, we were off. Ten minutes took us outside Damascus and soon the Thunderbird was burning through the scrub beyond. A further 40 minutes, we were heading into the foothills of Mount Lebanon. A convoy of T-72 tanks crunched down the highway in the opposite direction. President Assad, Assad waved goodbye from a hoarding. The road wound steeply, corkscrewing through pine trees and slopes of gorse, and suddenly we were there at the Syrian frontier, a rambling collection of concrete huts huddled under the pines, a little above us, at the summit of the mountains. We drove on through no man's land, past the skeleton of three burnt out cars. To our right rose a slope of conifers from which wafted the acrid scent of pine resin. We turned a corner and there amid the trees recently rebuilt lay the Lebanese frontier post. Outside it flapped the Lebanese tricolor, overlaid with the cedar of Lebanon. The thunderbird roared back into life, and at some speed we set off downhill into the green basin of the Bekar Valley. From above, it looked as beautiful and as bucolic as the Valley of Kashmir. Rivers, water meadows, green fields, long lines of poplars and beach avenues, all turning yellow in the early autumnal light. 
It looked a picture of pastoral innocence. Nothing about the Bekar indicated that it was actually the seedbed of one of the world's largest opium harvests and home to some of the Middle East's most formidable drug barons. On the concrete crash barriers near pockets of Syrian army outposts, the otherwise ubiquitous posters of the Lebanese Prime Minister, Rafi Kariri, all jowls and double chins like some corpulent Italian waiter, were replaced by the Assad family iconography, familiar in Syria. Assad in his paratroopers' fatigues. Assad, uh, the general with his peak cap. Assad, the statesman, an international pinstripe. Assad's dead son, Basil, in his trademark reflector shades. Sometimes the, hag the hagiography became more whimsical. On one Syrian pillbox, Assad and Basil were transformed into the idiom of Haidt Ashbury flower children, their scowling faces hanging off the stalks of bright, naively painted sunflowers. At other times, the iconography of the different power brokers in Lebanon was strangely intermingled, so that pinups of Assad, Basil, Hariri, and a brace of turbaned Iranian mullahs, popular among the Shias of the Bekaa, would appear together on a single crash barrier, sometimes in the unlikely company of a leggy Lebanese chanteurs or some sequined Egyptian movie starlet. Perhaps strangest of all were the unlikely lines, the unlikely lines of hoardings that rose above the forbidding ruins which stretched along the highway. A smiling Claudia Schiffer stretched out leopard-like in Salvatore Ferragamo next to a yellow sandstone French colonial villa so riddled with great shrapnel holes it resembled an outsized slice of Ermental. The Marlborough cowboy with his ten-gallon gallon hat and herd of steers beaming out over an apocalyptic wasteland of shattered tower blocks. A tube uh, of body mist, un beau corps sans effort, uh, set against the carbon black skeleton of twisted metal that had once been a filling station. From the bottom of the Bekaa, we crawled sluggishly up a narrow ridge, a single line of traffic moving slowly behind a pair of massive Syrian tank transporters, until at the top, we found ourselves overlooking down from an unexpected eminence, through a fog of smog, over the ruins of Beirut, to the shattered mirror of the Mediterranean beyond. The Thunderbird's outside bonnet swung over the hog's back of a bridge. And we were off. Down we twisted, through a series of S-bends, under the ruins, past the posters. Salvatore Ferragamo Port Hiver, an Italian villa pockmarked with small arms fire. Valentino, en exclusivité a Bible black hearse parked beside a church. Martini, right here, right now, two decapitated palm trees. Calvin by Calvin Klein, a dead tank. Cool Budweiser, on tap, a bombed out hospital. Lucky Strike, a cluster of skyscrapers so pockmarked with shrapnel, they looked like a mouthful of severely rotten teeth. Versatile by Versace. It was like a great morality tale spiraling downwards through one of the world's greatest monuments to human frailty. A huge vortex of greed and envy, resentment and intolerance, hatred and materialism. A five-long slalom of shell holes and designer labels, heavy artillery and glossy boutiques. Like a modern updating of a Byzantine apocalypse, it was the confusion that was most hell-like. Ayatollah Khomeini, hands raised in blessing, shared a billboard with a bottle of American aftershave. Below, huge American cars, Thunderbirds, Chevrolets, Corvettes, roared past building sites where monstrous machines, thickly carapaced like metal-clad cockroaches, moved earth, demolished ruins, dug holes. Occasionally, there was an explosion, and a small mushroom cloud of dust uh, appeared as a doomed tower block crashed to the earth, nudged by one of the grunting metal beetles below. Yet for all the destruction, in some places, the shrapnel marks were strangely beautiful, like a Kandinsky abstract, a perfect peppering of dots and dashes. It was a tribute to the arms dealer's art, a hail of metal perfectly distributed across a plaster canvas. Even the hideous ruins of 60s blocks had a strange fascination. Some appeared as if newly built. Only the puncture mark of a massive shell hole through the lateral wall of an apartment indicated what had happened to the interior and its occupants. Others were utterly wrecked. A single wall remained of a, as a gravestone to mark the whereabouts of an entire tower block. 
At a distance, an oblique exclamation of concrete and a tangle of metal rods, the building's top story, would remain where it had landed in the aftermath of the blast and collapse. Strangest of all were those blocks which had collapsed, where the collapsed concrete stories were now folded down on top of one, each other, on top of one another, like a pile of neatly pressed shirts that had been left hanging off the edge of an ironing board. Thick layers and tons of pre-stressed concrete curved over the edges of a hundred foot drops like soft folds of fine cotton. Despite the mess, astonishingly, the great majority of the wrecked apartments were still inhabited, in some whose walls were so eroded by shrapnel that they resembled pieces of chronically warm-eaten wood, I would notice washing hanging out to dry, or perhaps a shadowy figure taking the air on a half-clapsed balcony. As twilight fell over the ruined city, pale and ghostly lights began to came, come on in one after another of the apparently abandoned blocks. The ruins, it seemed, were vertical shanty towns, makeshift billets for impoverished sheer laborers or homeless Palestinians, all rushing to fill the vacuum left by the rehoused rich. Most had patched up their flats with pieces of corrugated iron or slashes of black plastic sheeting, but most others, perhaps the newest arrivals, had not. As we drove past, I found I could look into their illuminated interiors of these people's flats, for they were missing walls or had such perfectly huge shell holes that entire sweeps of rooms were opened up for public inspection, like some outsized advent calendar. In one flat, I saw a man getting dressed, nonchalantly pulling on his jeans. It was an unremarkable everyday scene, except that the wall of his apartment had entirely disappeared, so that he was framed by the black concrete superstructure around him, lit up like a cinema screen in the dark auditorium. I got back into the car and we drove down to Hotel Cavalier in Muslim West Beirut. There I checked into a room and spent the next few hours in the bar, recovering from the journey with the help of several glasses of cold Stella Artois and one of the most optimistic documents I've ever read, which I found at the bar. It's titled, Lebanon, the Promised Land of Tourism. We have five minutes for questions, if anyone would like to ask. Please say who you're addressing them to. The lady here with her arm out. Microphone, please. Thank you very much for a really interesting um, whip round all of your amazing work. This is a question mainly for B. Can I ask you about gender in travel writing? I've read quite a lot of wonderful travel books over the years, and something I'm struck by in some of them, not obviously any names on the panel, of course, um, sometimes there's too much of the great man trying to dominate nature, tame the savages that he encounters, and overcoming adversity. Is there a role for talking about gender in terms of travel writing? Well, um, uh, I'm glad you asked. No, I mean, everybody picks the, the travel writing companion that they wish to travel with, so that's self-filtering in a way. As a reader, I do not gravitate towards a writer who will just go around the world being very clever. That's not necessarily a gender thing, though. I mean, yes, I do read some extraordinary... Uh, the name escapes... Who's the brilliant Irish... Devlin Murphy, for example, Chief Springs to mind, but I, I don't want actually to draw that in terms of gender, um, more in terms of a sort of openness of mind. And what for me really sticks in, in, and is very telling about the writer that you're going on this journey with is how they encounter people on that journey. So it's about the interactions that the author has with people. Like we all remember your landlord, William, in the City of Gins, and it's those, it's those things that give it a real spark for me and how that happens. And as a writer, you have to, obviously you have control over it, but you have to allow a degree of vulnerability. You're, you're on a learning curve when you encounter these people when you're traveling. Does that answer your question, vaguely? Um, give it a big, please, big round of applause for Nidhi Duga, B. Rowland, Rob Schmitz, Arti Prasad, and the great Simon Winchester. Thank you very much, guys. Ladies and gentlemen, one more big round of applause for Ariti, B, Nidhi, Simon, and Rob. I'm sorry I missed you to begin with. <laughs> Rob Schmitz. And also to our, our sponsor, Aga Khan Foundation. And to William. 
So we we do have our next session. Will be coming up very shortly. Kwaja Gabi Nawaz, a message of love that will be coming up at 1:40 or very soon after. Yes.